for joining us again for another Reality 2.0 podcast. I'm Catherine Druckmann. And with me today, as always, is Doc Searles and hey a few other people. This is a, this is a little bit of a different um, approach we're taking this time because we're in, a, we're in a little bit of an unprecedented situation. So we're having kind of a round table discussion. We have Petros Kachupis and we have Kyle Rankin and we also have Sean Powers. Uh, and I hope you, you recognize all those names. Uh, if you've been listening for a while, you, you've heard from all of them. Um, but I wanted to, to let them each sort of introduce themselves and I'll give you a little bit more about me too. Um, I have worked from home for, for a long, long time as have we all really. Um, both with Linux Journal and now I'm, I'm working remotely as a software engineer. And so, so for us, this is, this is just sort of, our work life is, hasn't changed that much, but everything else has changed tremendously. And, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but I'll, I'll hand it off to, uh, let's say, Sean, you want to go first? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Sean Powers. Uh, start, I know this group from Linux Journal, looking at the, the names across the top here, this is like the Linux Journal crew from, from way back when. Um, I, I'm currently doing online training. Uh, so, I mean, this kind of my jam, right? Teaching over the internet and, and working from a home office. Um, now, yeah, I'm, I'm doing uh, IT training online. Um, and I, I guess that's about it. Nothing else has changed since the last time I talked with, uh, with you guys on the podcast. My life is boring. Okay. And Doc, let's, let's just remind everyone of, of where you are. And, and, and- <laughs> we're, uh, right now, uh, physically, I'm in uh, Santa Barbara, California. Um, we came out here a week and a day ago from New York City, um, from a strangely empty airport uh, on a full plane because everybody was going home or to wherever they knew they were going to have to hunker down. Um, and uh, so that's, I mean, that's, that's enough for now. And I can fill in other details later. Awesome. Kyle? All right. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm Kyle Rankin and I work uh, full-time as the chief security officer at a company called Purism. And we are a completely remote workforce. So everyone uh, works from home here. Um, so I've been, since I've been working here for about two years and working from home that whole time. And then before that, I worked at a couple of different startups where just because of where I happen to live in the Bay Area, commuting is a nightmare here. Um, so I've been able over, over time to sort of claw my way into positions uh, and turn down other positions that, so that I could get a place where I could work from home more and more. So now it's full time um, doing that. Right now, I'm te- physically, I'm in the North Bay um, in a van um, outside of my house on lockdown. Yes, and we, we definitely want to hear more about the van life and working remotely. Um, so Petros, tell us, tell us what you're doing. Do a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> um, that is not true. Well, so I've been working remotely for on and off for many years now with various startups, but currently I have been remote with Cray Inc. Now, to the Packard Enterprise. I've uh, been working remote with a bunch of other remote employees building the back end storage for uh, supercomputers. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I do now alongside, you know, little things here and there, but uh, it's been the remote life, uh, like I said, on and off for the better part of the uh, last decade. So, so, so maybe one of the first things we should talk about is how, how is this, how is this situation a little bit different from what we're used to? And My did anybody feel, challenge. yeah, that's a good, has to be a big challenge. Not obviously not all of us have kids at home, but um I wonder how people are coping with that. How are you doing with that, Petrus? I think you're the only one who... Because now, um, you know, it's, you know, they were supposed to have spring break in a couple of weeks, but now the school has switched to an e-learning setup. But what's happening is I do a lot of screaming uh, (laughs) to get them to do their schoolwork they finish early because how much, you know, can they do from, you know, a remote e-learning uh, environment. And then the rest of the time they play video games, fighting with each other while I continue to scream and hopefully nobody 
peers on the other end of the conference call. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle is real. Yeah, so there's a lot of me muting my mic and hoping <laughs> that it's muted when uh, <laughs> I try to get them to stop fighting. But it's been rough the past week um, alone because of you know what's been co going on in, in uh, current global pandemic affairs. Yeah. So, so speaking of e-learning, so Sean, I don't know if it, people may not know this about you. You have quite an extensive background in, um, well, educational systems. Yes. Yes. Uh, I wondered if you could weigh in a little bit on, on what's, what's going on with, you know, teachers suddenly sure. having to, uh, yeah, so my full-time job used to be, uh, I was the tech director for a K-12 school district in Northern Michigan. And um, so after that, I, you know, now I'm working for CBT Nuggets making um, online training, but uh, I, this, this new uh, world that we live in, right? Teachers are all of a sudden being forced to do that e-learning uh, to make Petro scream. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, they do the, that e-learning and most of them, have never done that before. And so, you know, we had no prep time. All of a sudden students were sent home and they have to, uh, teachers now have to teach them. Uh, the big thing is that especially elementary teachers uh, are struggling trying to come up with what that even means. I mean, we can give them software, right? We can give them Moodle, we can give them Google Classroom, we can give them Zoom, we can give them Microsoft Teams, whatever platform their school might offer that's just software, right? I mean, that's like a shiny hammer. It's just a tool, but, but they don't necessarily know how to teach kids remotely. And like I said, it's especially uh, an issue with elementary students, the middle school, high school, college uh, teachers and professors are, are handling things a little better because usually those have some sort of online element anyway, um, or at least the students are familiar enough with being online uh, that they can adapt. But boy, I had a meeting on Monday. It was the last actual meet space meeting I've had. Um, Monday morning, I went into a school to help teachers try to figure out what they're going to do because we're off for a week uh, and then they have to start doing this e-learning. And um, the elementary teachers were just kind of panicked. They have no idea what that's going to look like. So I don't know an answer to that. I, I know that um, this isn't a plug for my company, but my company's given me some time off to create some free training for teachers, just simplistic, like this is how you set up a Google Classroom. Because while that seems really easy for tech people like you and me, if you're an elementary teacher who doesn't use a computer for very much, things like that are just foreign. So that's what I'm doing. I'm hoping to make some free training that uh, is simple and concise and can help teachers adapt a little bit. That's, that's actually really nice to hear. So something that I've thought of, and it's a concern of mine, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what happens to the kids who don't have computers at home? I mean, there must be, I mean, obviously it's done now. There, there are, and even more than that, there are people who have no internet access or even yeah, access to get internet. So uh, the, the computer part, what we've done, and I think what a lot of schools are doing are checking computers out, right? Like, especially if you're a, a district that has Chromebooks or something, you know, check them out so students can take them home and use them. Uh, the majority of students in rural Northern Michigan here have internet access, but there's probably about 15% that not only don't have internet access, but where they live, there's no access to broadband. There's no cell phone coverage enough to have any sort of a data plan. And so teachers are not only teaching their online classes, but they have to come up with like paper handouts that they are coming up with a way to deliver. And even that, are they mailing it to them? And I mean, I think so far that's what they're doing because it's not a huge number, but what a nightmare. And then are they gonna mail them back? Who knows how that's gonna actually work? Um, but yeah, it's an issue because we're such a huge country geographically that there are still places with no internet access and it isn't even a financial thing. It's just a, uh, they ju there's just no options. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I know here, you know, where I live, because it's not, it's, it's not quite as rural and spread apart, at least our district um, is offering, you know, checking out computers and that sort of thing. They're also, uh, uh, our local ISP um, Sonic that I use, and then also Comcast are both offering free internet access for the next three months to anyone who doesn't have it, who needs it, who has a kid, um, so that they have an option. But yeah, I mean, the, the question I'm wondering about, especially for elementary kids, is if you have someone, you know, my son's in second grade, for instance, 
And while he's, you know, a good student and sits still and all of that, I know there's plenty of kids that have a hard time sitting still in a classroom when there's a teacher right there to correct them. How is that going to work when they're sitting in front of a computer um, looking through a camera at a teacher or something, you know, is there, I'm assuming parents will, some parents will just have to sit right behind their kid the entire time. I mean, I have no idea how that's supposed to work. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I actually, so I take a Hebrew, le, a Hebrew class, I'm learning Hebrew. Um, and we've gone online and I'm, I'm an adult, you know, and I'm used to sitting and concentrating and working in front of my computer and I am having a hard time. Like it, it's a different experience. I mean, it fundamentally is, and you have to get used to it. So I can't imagine how a bunch of, you know, squirming first graders and whatnot are going to handle this. And, you know, at the same time, their parents are very likely working at home at the same time and can't, you know, necessarily keep an eye on them. They're, they're Petros <laughs> and they're, they're going to drive Petros crazy. Well, well, I mean, what if, Go ahead. what if little, Tom, what if little Tommy just runs away from the computer for a while and goes goes and plays with his toys. I mean, what's the teacher going to do exactly? You know, like in the classroom, Tommy, get back to your desk or whatever. Um, in a computer world, you know, there's there's no real nothing that the teacher's going to be able to do to keep the class in line. Yeah, I find myself wondering what happens institutionally here, especially if this goes on. Um, you know, at first it was going to be like maybe for a week or two weeks, but now there's there's not a horizon to this. That's a clear horizon. Of course, the summer comes along, but in the summer, you expect to go outdoors, right? <laughs> and and um, here we're in a, uh, we, we, several of us, at least two of us, I think, use the term lockdown, which is a prison term. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not something that we're used to experiencing in, in, in the everyday world. So I'm wondering if, if there's any learnings that are coming, like, okay, well, this is working so far, or is it all, or is it all too early for that? From my well, standpoint, I, it's way too early. I, I, I think that there are many schools who have kind of taken like a week or so off just to let the teachers prep. So I think yeah. that we're just starting to see it really happen. And I'll throw one more thing out there and then I'll stop because I've been talking this whole time. But um, special needs kids or at-risk kids, uh, that's something that's difficult to handle in the school environment. So those kids are going to be, I mean not to use a, a cheesy cliche term, but I mean, they're going to be left behind again. Uh, and uh, it, it just breaks my heart. So I, I don't have an answer to that other than it's like one more thing that is just going to be a mm. struggle as schools say, they're starting to say, we're not going to be open for the rest of the school year. That's half a year gone. Uh, anyway, I'll stop yeah, because to, I'm getting depressed. To, to Sean's point. Yeah. Um, in our school district, our uh, children were, uh, or actually I should say our teachers took a couple days to figure and sort things out. And uh, they ended up uh, deciding to rely on Google Classroom. You know, the kids uh, were able to check out their Chromebooks and bring them home. And every day is a new uh, agenda that the teacher publishes early in the morning and then they have to have all their assignments turned in. But the thing is, it's a learning experience for everyone. Not just a learning experience for the kids because this is the first time that they're having to deal with this, but also a learning experience for the teachers because again, this is the first time they're having to deal with this. It's, it's, it's a grade school. So they fortunately, and, and like Sean pointed out earlier, they're, they fortunately have the tools. It's just knowing how to use those tools. And it's not that they're illiterate or can't, aren't capable of knowing or learning how to use the tools. It's just they're learning as they go along, which is part of the challenge. Yeah. And my wife also helps out. It's not just me screaming at the kids. She's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, I think I think one of the you know outside of outside of education, I think there's going to be a lot of learning in terms of remote work, because there's there are a lot of companies that have allowed remote work before, and I've been parts of companies that have said yes, certain people can work from home sometimes, but it's it's very rarely been successful because unless the entire workforce is working remotely you typically don't build the kind of tools. It, anyone who's working remotely becomes a second class citizen unless you do it well. Um, so for example, you'll have a conference meeting where you know 90% of the participants are in a room together and there's the two remote people who are calling in and then the microphones in the conference room are just horrible. And so no one can, you know, they can't hear mm. you or you can't hear them, that sort of thing. 
and that's just one minor thing in addition to all the other there's all kinds of other infrastructure in an office where it assumes that you're physically going to be there that breaks down if you're not um, so i think for the first time for many companies this is the first time where they will be forced to actually make their work from home um, infrastructure work um, because they will all be using it and when when the boss can't get something to work or is something isn't you know it, it will all get fixed and then people will actually experience what it's like to work from home on infrastructure that works with everyone using it for the first time my prediction is that you know at least some of these people when everything gets back to normal really won't want to go back you know they will have settled in it'll be a couple of months where they have settled into this lifestyle and i mean i'm already hearing about how much other how how all of these people are i'm i'm learning to bake bread and i'm you know i'm doing all of these things that they didn't do before because they were spending hours commuting to work, you know, and away from their family. So I think a certain number of people will have a hard time um, g giving it up. And when you have companies like Twitter, for instance, that recently announced that they're they're focusing more on remote workers because of some of the struggles with their super expensive San Francisco headquarters, I could see a lot of startups and other just large San Francisco companies saying, you know, maybe it's not worth it to have this really expensive real estate here. Yeah. So, so that's an interesting point and actually a really great segue. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so I'm wondering, I, you know, since, since this has started happening, I, I've been thinking about um, open source software. So open source software has for a long time been developed by distributed teams. They don't necessarily work together. They're involved in the, in the same project. They may work for different companies and, and they're all over and they're, they're contributing to the same thing. And it, it, it is, I think worked well and, and people involved in these projects are used to working in this way. And I just wondered like, how, how can those of us who, who, who have worked in that environment for a long time help the, everybody else who maybe, you know, isn't used to this. I think that, so what I do, you know, I, I somehow, I don't know how I got so lucky to work with, you know, so many, so many smart people. I mean, <laughs> so in my whole life, really, when external and now not working with like the smartest Drupalers there are, but everybody's all over the world, right? And, and we get, we, it gets done and it gets done really well. So I just wondered, you know, we all have a little pieces of that wisdom and, and I wondered if there are things that we could impart to people, just even basic things like. Right. One of the first things I think we need to point out is that Currently, it's not normal, right? I mean, I've worked from home for over a decade. And the past couple of weeks, I have been so much less productive just because mm -hmm. of the chaos the world is in. You know, I, I posted a blog entry. I said, you know, welcome to uh, the world of working at home or welcome to telecommuting. This is not telecommuting, right? This has just yeah, been a no, crazy time. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's one important thing for people to realize that if, if it feels weird and you're not productive, that's, it's, it's not the norm. Um, as far as adjusting, yeah, I, I I just wanted to put that out there that what they're experiencing now is not normal. I mean, most people are not working on the, the same kitchen table that their kids are eating fruit loops next to them because the kids happen to be home all day too. I mean, that's what not, that's not normal, you know? So anyway, that's a good point. And then frankly, you know, everyone's mental health is taking a hit because everyone's very st stressed out and, and, and it's the stress of the unknown. And it's, you know, there are so, there are so many things that are, that are, so abnormal and so unprecedented that even those of us who are in a routine and a daily, you know, work from home, go to your home office, set up your screens and your Zoom, um, we're still having to face this, uh, the newness of the current situation. And it is very hard. It's, it's yeah, also, a, yeah, go, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I think there's a couple of things just when you were talking about ha uh, a distributed team and how a lot of, of free software um, has been developed using these distributed teams that were working remotely and how it's been successful. I think part of that that maps well to regular companies, and I'm mostly speaking from my experience here at Purism since we both are distributed globally and everyone's telecommuting, is you have a bunch of people in a lot of different time zones. And if you're lucky, part of someone's workday time zone crisscrosses with your time zone. But for people who are on the Pacific um, time zone in the U.S., talking to someone who's um, on the eastern side of europe you know there's a big there's a big difference between those time zones and so you only have a little bit of crossover and what that causes is a great importance in decide in asynchronous communication and where so for example in our case when something really needs to be done and answered um we we use email for that can you hear the chicken in the background i'm just checking no no Excellent. I don't, That's even yeah. <laughs> good. I don't know. I kind Good. of. I want. I'm, the, 
I don't want to hear the chicken. The, the chicken suppression uh, system is working. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Good. Yeah. The, the, the chicken noise cancellation system. Is, okay, good. Um, anyway, yeah. So, for example, um, we, we try our best to not make critical decisions and, um, within a chat room uh, unless every single participant is in there. And in that case, we treat it like we're having a group meeting on, on a subject. But what tends to happen, especially if you have if you spend a lot of time zones, is you will have two people, let's say out of a group of five who should be decision makers on something, chatting about an issue. They may come to a consensus themselves, but if they if they were to just move on from that decision and decide it's settled then, then everyone who just didn't happen to be floating in the chat room at the time misses out. It's it's the same as if you call a meeting and make a decision and only two of the four five people show up to the meeting, or even more accurately, if you just show up in a kitchen um, in the in the office kitchen and and run into somebody else and then chat impromptu about something. So what we try to do is make heavy use of tickets and email, uh, which can both be asynchronous to either, you know, in the case of ticketing, you can track issues and have a discussion within comments on tickets to, to have different viewpoints. And the same with email threads for things that, you know, there's an assumption that chat, you might wake up and declare chat room bankruptcy. I tend to do that for rooms. If someone hasn't explicitly um, uh, called me out by name to ask me something. If I just go to a room and the in the backlog is you know pages and pages because I was asleep but half the company was awake. Sometimes I just I wake up and read a little bit and just say, well, I'm declaring bankruptcy on this channel because there's just no way to keep up with everything. Um, but email is a completely different matter. If it, if it's an email, then every single email is read and responded to if it needs to. That, that's an interesting thing, and, and what you said about the. Uh, um, dealing internationally is uh, um, a, a really big one. Right? One of the reasons that, I mean, I I just came woke up from a nap before this call, which started at uh, two o'clock West Coast time, uh, because uh, my wife is also a Linux Journal veteran, um, uh, is involved with um, a, it doesn't even matter what it is, but it's a, but many of the people on it are in Europe. And so they're not just eight hours behind ahead of us, but nine hours and maybe even 10. And, and, and they're also not, they're not only calls that happen at crazy hours for us, but there are texts, they text. And so, and that's another reason why the asynchronous thing could work a lot better. Um, we haven't worked out the social part of this thing yet where, um, so for example, we, we decided this morning that we would turn off, she would put her phone on do not disturb and I would put the alarm on my phone. Um, so that, uh, that's just one, one small way that we're beginning to cope with, uh, with living in a, in a world where we have many people in different time zones. That by the way, was one of the big advantages of being in New York. New York is only five or six hours behind. Um, but it's just, it's also that we haven't worked out that even the manners yet, you know, on, on a lot of this stuff, what's, what's the right way to interrupt people? You know, what's the, you know, in, in the physical world, it's, it's weird enough where, you know, are we elbow bumping each other or we're just not even sure how to be with each other in the physical space. We have to go out for food. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, it may seem irrelevant, but I, I don't think it is in, in, in Asia, for example, it's uh, especially in China, it's just considered a bad practice to go without a face mask. Um, even if having a face mask, God doesn't necessarily protect you that much. It's just, bad manners to go out without a face mask when there's a, when, when, when anybody's sick or thought to be sick and we haven't worked, we just haven't worked a lot of that stuff out yet. It's going to take, take some time. In this awkward well, silence, I'll just, yeah, it's this kind of awkward silence. Catherine could cut I out later. Talking. No, that was me. <laughs> I was talking with on mute. So this is, this is an exercise in uh, learning to use zoom, even though I've used it many, many times and I use it every day. Uh, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> so, but yeah, asynchronous communication is, is, is a really important um, reminder. I mean, it, it's, so I think one of the reasons probably that, so Drupal development happens heavily on Slack. It's, it's, it, Slack is the thing. Um, and I think part of it is just the threaded communication because when you're, you've got to talk to somebody in Switzerland and then somebody in Australia and you, you can't rely on something, you know, a chat room that's going to, well, that you're going to have to <laughs> declare bankruptcy on because you, you need those, those threaded conversations. And so, you know, any tool, email, 
Slack, whatever it is, you know, I think uh, respecting those, those time zones is a big part of it. Actually, well, in chat, go ahead, Kyle. Go ahead. I was, gonna, I was just going to say that in one advantage to chat is that you can two, three, five people can have a conversation at the same time without it being rude because you're waiting for someone else and you feel rude interrupting someone. Um, in chat, it's, you know, you have a bunch of people typing at once and it's not considered rude. You can, and so you can get a lot, if everyone types fast enough to make it work, you can, ha you can get a lot more progress in terms of group meetings in chat compared sometimes to a, you know, a phone call or a, a video call because on a video call or a voice call, only one person can, can talk at once. And you're always just like, like we're doing here, we have a lot of us on here where we're approaching the upper limit for having sort of an efficient group chat because once you get further beyond this, if everyone wants to say something, it just takes forever to wait turns. Whereas in a chat, everyone can say their things. And it's difficult to get used to things like, uh, so we're, we're in a Zoom right now to click the raise your hand button. I, I, that just doesn't feel natural, right? I mean, it's we're, we're used to having conversations. And even in this podcast, how many times have we politely interrupted each other just so we could say what we wanted to say? And that is different. You know, and uh, the company that I'm in is all over the planet too. If the world really was flat, it would sure make things a lot easier. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, we have people in, in South Africa and London and both coasts of the US and probably somewhere else I, I'm, I'm forgetting, uh, somebody in Japan now. And so trying to find those times where we can meet. Yeah, it's tough. Slack is also, uh, our company uses Slack for everything uh, because it is this centralized threaded conversation thing. So serious things actually happen in Slack because it's, I mean, it's not quite chat, right? It's not like it is, but it isn't. I don't know. It feels like a, I, I don't know. I can't really explain it. If, you, if you're a Slack user, you know what I'm talking about. It's just the kind of the way you can communicate. And if somebody doesn't respond right away, that doesn't, it feels normal kind of thing. So uh, I think there are tools that are being developed for the idea of around earth uh, with different time zones. And, and I'm thankful for that because otherwise, yeah, it, it makes it really challenging. Wait, wait, here, here's a, a question for the, for the brain trust here. One of the things that I'm sensing is that uh, this, this plague may be, elevating the big bad companies um because they're you know people know i mean i'm watching zoom win i mean i you know there's there are several other conferencing systems but zoom seems to be the one that's emerging and and i could see them becoming the slack of 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 conferencing um the slack won that one um there are a lot of people i know in families and elsewhere that are uh, moving back onto Facebook if they were off of it, because that's the way that they're, you know, that's where they can get together with a bunch of other people. The threshold of creating a group on Facebook is very, very low. Um, the system works well enough. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of co I'm concerned about that, but I also see, as, and Catherine brought this up earlier, it may have been before the call, uh, that we're also watching... Um, Privacy get thrown out the window in many ways. People are are less concerned about that. There's a, um, you know, when we're making, I mean, it, it, the, the all-purpose metaphor is, is war. You know, we're at war with this disease. We're at war with something or other. And uh, there's a, a brilliant book, very depressing, uh, written by uh, Chris Hedges, who is a, the, uh, a Pulitzer, multiple Pulitzer, I think, winner of, um, as a reporter on war for the New York Times many years ago. And he's turned into a little bit of a crazy over, the, over recent years. And he's very much on the very, very far left. But his war reporting was brilliant. And he wrote a book maybe about 20 years ago called War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. And one of the things he talks about in that is that in a war, you throw the laws out. We don't need laws. You know, I mean, we're under martial law right now. That's, what this, that's what's going on. You know, we're told everybody stay indoors, you know, like it's an air raid. And, and oh, by the way, don't come out, you know, <laughs> and, and rebuild all your institutions. Oh, maybe some of the people can stay out, which are the people delivering packages for Amazon and the rest of it. But um, it, it's, I, I really worry because freedom is a very big part of what brought all of us together in the first place, that uh, that, that freedom and, and, and the, the things we make for ourselves and, you know, a, a lot of these 
virtues, the virtues of free software, the virtues of, of, of self-reliance, a lot of other things. Some are elevated, like the self-reliance one. Um, but I'm really worried about privacy, for example, which was under attack already and is now, I feel, for example, and, and encryption is good. So I'm gonna, the, the back doors are going to go in and there they are, you know, and we're not going to get rid of them. That, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there are a few concerns. One is that people are not going to pay attention to things like the earn it bill. That they need to pay attention to, frankly, but we're too so tell, tell us about that, what, the, the earn it bill. Which... So this is the, the thing that um, the best source of information is probably just go to EFF. They, they're posting about it constantly, okay. but it's, it's a bill introduced that um, can, will basically hold tech companies liable for information that, that it, for, for anything that is, is sent through their, their system. So if somebody organizes, my interpretation of it is that if somebody organizes a terrorist attack on Facebook or, or sends, you know, exploits children in some way through, you know, through some platform that they're now held liable. And basically the concern is that this is the, the, the first step towards uh, encryption backdoors and possibly basically illegal, you know, making encryption illegal. Um, but I encourage everyone to um, and, and read up on that because it really is very important. But then there are some other concerns and that is, you know, there, there's been news in the last few days, a couple of things. One is um, basically malware apps. People are, people are terrified, right? So they're going to download some, some app that, that is, is supposed to be tracking the disease, but is actually malware. So, so that's one. And then another one is, is various groups um, and governments are using the same kind of questionable technology that they use to, to track down terrorists, um, in theory, to track the spread of disease. And this is one of those things where you, I mean, who's going to stand up and, and, and say, no, let's not use the technology at our disposal to stop a pandemic. Of course, we're going to say, yeah, let's go for it. But the problem is, is that, you know, is that it introduces the potential to, to bring in some kind of scary exploitation along with it, you know, and like, what, what are we giving up while we're not paying attention is, is my biggest concern, I think. And, and, um, Anyway, I'm sure y'all have a yeah. lot of thoughts on that. So just, just so, just so people know, the 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 earn it is earn like you're uh, earning a wage, but it's the Eliminating Abusive and Rampant Neglect of Interactive Technologies Act, um, and it grants sweeping powers to the executive branch. Um, and there's a and EFF does have some stuff on that, so if you look that up. Um, but I mean, last night I I heard somebody who I think of as a uh, a privacy advocate talk about how having this particular, um, I'm using hand gestures here, but this is radio, uh, um, uh, a thermometer, right? There's a thermometer that can report your temperature and, and how the, the company that makes this thermometer, I forget the name of the company, but it's an electronic thermometer that reports your temperature back uh, to the company, but the company is, way ahead of the CDC in knowing where the outbreaks are going to be. The, 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 the social upside is enormous to this. It's a real lifesaver. Um, and I don't even know, I don't remember the name of this company. If the company, if, if, the, if the reporting of one's temperature to this company is in fact an opt-in thing and it's very clearly articulated and people are doing it um, for a social good uh, voluntarily, I don't have a problem with that. But the way she was talking about it is that actually they don't do that. They just have this data on you, which is more like a the typical American tech way. And and I'm you know I'm worried about where that one goes. And that's just one example of it. But it's but we have to note that on the one hand there there are real serious possibly life saving social benefits to uh, this potential or actual loss of privacy and privacy on the other hand. And how do we weigh that? And how do we, um, how do we approach that? Is, is the learning that's going to come out of this that we need much better ways of controlling what we disclose about ourselves and under what conditions and making sure that they're anonymized, that we keep a record on that. And that's an auditable record that we can go back and, and deal with the company on which, by the way, the CCPA in California actually 
does to some degree. It doesn't close the barn door, but allows you to get some horses back if the barn door has been left open. Um, but what, you know, or is the learning going to be great? You know, we're a, a lot better off if our lives are fully exposed and we've lost all our privacy because that's going to help us stop disease or terrorism, which is the last yeah. big thing. And, and, and that's the thing, right? So this is another situation, one that is, I think, easier for us to identify with. Whereas if we're talking about like a company having our data so that they can target ads for us, it's easy to say that's a horrible misuse of our data. Our privacy is so important. This is yeah. terrible. We should stop it. But now, yeah, like you said, you know, we're talking about is if this data is being used to save lives, our own lives, should we think through what, what we're allowed to? And, and I think maybe that is the answer is we should have the choice to do that. Um, and I don't know if the company that you're thinking of is Withings or not, but I actually have. No, it's, it's not Withings because I have one of their. Uh, yeah, I their, have their thermometer that actually keeps track. Yeah, the thermometer. I have their their original uh, scale, um, yeah, which I got because it was a French company and they had a really great privacy policy. Then they got bought by Nokia and sold to somebody who sold it to somebody else. They don't have that policy anymore. Actually, um, they, Withings owns it again. No, no oh, they do. Oh, yeah. wow. You're, you're way ahead of me on this. So, yeah, I'm a big Withings person. I'm wearing a Withings watch right now. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I, anyway. So, so I, have an, I have an Apple watch here that, that, that I have in order to, to do heart monitoring. And Apple has actually a very, very good policy on that if people are wondering whether they actually follow it or not. But I think they do where they don't have the data. You know, I can do an electro electrocardiogram that I could share um, with my cardiologist, um, which I have, but, um, but Apple doesn't know it. I mean, it's, it's entirely my data. Um, and they have a really good policy in respect to sharing data on a permitted basis for research purposes, uh, that, that I think should be a model for everybody else, but I don't have the sense that everybody else is following the same kind of model because, you know, at, you know, a company like Apple makes money, um, other ways they don't make money on the in the spying business and you know whereas google does and facebook does and some other companies do i have to admit and, and you're right about apple their their privacy policy is shockingly um tolerable i guess or yeah it's simple it's, it's simple it's and it's good i mean it's right? yeah it, it's basically good manners you know yeah. and, and manners is you know we're we're it's none of our business what you do with our products and we're not going to pay attention to that and if you want us to for diagnostic purposes we'll We'll do that, but but uh, but we have, we're not in that business, and we're not interested in being in that business. So so something that, that that's actually concerned me for for quite some time is so I've been reading a little bit about um, how law enforcement agencies actually get around the uh, Fourth Amendment by literally just buying marketing data. Who needs a warrant when you can buy all the information you need? As a, you know, pretend you're an advertiser, you you, you can have it, right? And now, and that, that's a scary thing, right? But now, you know, the, the same technology, um, arguably used for good, could also very easily be used for nevarious purposes. So, so taking the example of tracking the, 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 the epidemic, pandemic, you know, let's say, you know, you've identified people who are positive and you can round up the location data of everybody who has ever, who has been within six feet of that person and, and, you know, warn them to make you or potentially require them to be tested, which is a whole other conversation. But, you know, it's, it's things like that, that are, that make sense, I suppose, but, but can raise some, some kind of scary questions. And so, yeah, I, you know, I think that's something that's, that's worth thinking about. Do, do I want a government, a corporation or whatever to, to know, you know, to have that information about me? I, you know, I don't know. So, so let's, let's take the example of Clearview AI. Um, Clearview AI is the biggest perpetrator of this. And the, a lot of, and they're at clearview.ai. And if you look them up, you're going to find a zillion stories. But basically, they have um, by far the, apparently the most advanced facial recognition, and and we may have talked about this before on the show. But um, but facial recognition is something that uh, us as human. I mean, I, my personal feeling about this is that a uh, the only entities that should know somebody's face are other people and their dogs, and other than that, nobody else should know your face. However, for crime solving incredibly helpful. Um, 
for tracking people, incredibly helpful, for, for solving old crimes, for solving cold case files, all sorts of things. Um, uh, it's, it's really helpful. And police departments all over the place have found it very useful, and they buy it, and supposedly they sell only to those. Um, but, you know, do we want only the police departments to have our faces on file? I, you know, it used to be they'd want your mugshot on file, but I don't want, I don't, I've not committed any crimes worthy of having a mugshot. So, and I'd rather like not having a mugshot, but if, if the state of New York or the state of California has my virtual mugshot by simply scanning the world and, and finding lots of instances of me that they can, you know, uh, pull with AI a, a, a version of me that they can see. So th think about it with this pandemic thing. Let's say it gets really bad. And let's say um, we know it kills geezers like me, but it's not going to kill young people. And, and there are young people going around that are carriers and are known to be carriers. And we have enough intelligence collectively to know who's a carrier or that when we get tested, um, that it goes on, you know, that we start pull, really pulling together like other countries do really good medical records on everybody. And, um, and that on our records is that we are carriers of the, of the, of the novel coronavirus um, and, and, but are, you know, and could possibly spread it. And, you know, some young person, you know, goes out to a bar they're not supposed to go to and they get spotted uh, and we're on kind of martial law, they can get hauled in. That's, and it's for the good of everybody, right? Well, Johnny, you got out, you shouldn't have been out. Um, we're, we're all trying to keep people from getting killed here. Um, we caught you, we're going to take you back in. And we have a surveillance state. And that, that's one of the choices. There was a, 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 a Zoom with 73 people that, were, that I was on this morning, which, by the way, had the raised hand. It was a better UI than the one I just saw that, that I'm using here. I don't know how that worked. But anyway, um, uh, and this, this guy from the Red Cross said that there, there are basically two different approaches we can take to this. And, and one of them is the all surveillance top-down government runs it, companies are involved in it. Um, we gather all the intelligence we possibly can and we manage this thing in a somewhat centralized way where we're pulling in intelligence from distributed sources. Uh, people are involved in it, but basically it is top down and draconian. And, and that, that's, a, that's an approach. That's, not, that's, the, that's the Chinese approach. It's not the American or European approach, but it's one that's on the table. And it could be applied to other things as well, right? Where it could be we're perfecting ways to deal with um, pandemic issues that may not just be um, disease um, that, or just threats, anything that's a threat to the state or to whoever is in charge, um, we can pull this stuff together. And that's, anyway, I'm concerned about that. Yeah, it's all a slippery slope. And, you know, and you bring up, things like Clearview AI and you know I I always my question is do, what make what makes us trust law enforcement I mean not to get overly political yeah. but there's nothing that exempts a you know a law enforcement officer from being the guy who, who misuses the technology to stalk his ex-girlfriend you know or exactly. well and, and, well, and, and beyond that I'm sorry go ahead I was gonna yeah, say well well, and beyond that, um, I mean, there's a, a follow-up article with Clearview that showed that uh, there's a, there were some of their clientele were just wealthy individuals who loved the ability to be in a room and take a picture of someone that they were, that maybe in one case, this guy would take pictures of people his daughter was with and then get their dossier and figure mm, out who I they were yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. That was massively disturbing. Incredibly. Yeah. yeah and let's and... not forget, let's not forget that, you know, governments are not always acting in our best interest. Again, not to get overly political, but yeah. I, I sure wouldn't want to be in an ICE detention facility right now. So Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> the state of New Jersey is, is the, the first one to say, to forbid the use of Clearview AI to their police departments. They, they said that's the step too far. Would they say that now? They said that about a month ago, a month and a half ago. Would they say it now? It's an interesting question. Yeah, and I think that is the question. That, that is the question at the heart of our conversation, I think, is that what, what are the unforeseen consequences of, of having to take these extreme measures right now? So here, here's a, a, second, a second thing. There, there's a, um, what, uh, one of the discussions we've had uh, here in Santa Barbara um, 
but we could have them anywhere. I'm sure you're having them in all your locations. I'm especially curious about you, 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 you Sean, because of your involvement with the schools and all that, which is that um, uh, we remain physical beings, which means we're local and, and a lot of problems are solved best locally. And, um, and that's, that's one of the things we're talking about here in Santa Barbara, where, where um, even if people are not seeing and touching each other, they're very aware of each other's presence and who's and checking in on each other and sharing intelligence about, like we found out yesterday, what are the stores that are open, open early for seniors? Um, I'm a senior uh, and, and probably tomorrow morning between seven and eight, I'm going to go in at seniors hour um, when the shelves are freshly stocked at, at several of the local stores. And an interesting thing about that is that um, misinformation, that, that somebody said this and I tweeted it that, you know, when um, I forget exactly how it went, but um, when the going gets tough, the market for bullshit drops to zero. You know, when lives are at stake, the, the market for bullshit drops to zero. Uh, and we saw that happen with, uh, with Trump. He had to stop bullshitting. You know, he couldn't bullshit anymore. He, he had to, you know, so wait, this is a serious thing. I'm just going to say serious stuff because, it, you know, I, I, I could play the, the bullshit game for as long as that worked, but I can't right now. But at the local level, that's always been the case. You know, when I live where there are floods and earthquakes and, um, uh, and that when we had a, a, what was called a debris flow in Montecito, which is one zip code from here uh, two years ago, um, you know, everybody who had any, knowledge of anything weighed in and helped out. Uh, and, and there was no bullshit whatsoever. There was, and, and I'm wondering if, if the no bullshit imperative at the local level uh, applies in some generalized way that we, that's starting to emerge or we can at least think about. I, I can say, uh, you know, we're here in, in rural Northern Michigan. Um, I know the, for the education part, the, the parents are being very unparent like, when it comes to cooperating. And, and that sounds bad, mm-hmm. but I say that as the husband of a mm-hmm. teacher and somebody who worked at a school for a lot of years. Uh, parents, uh, I, I think, lose track of the humanity of the people who are educating their, uh, their students. Mm-hmm. So I think that we've seen uh, parents be far more patient and understanding. Um, and also just on a local level, you, know, you, you mentioned you have natural disasters there. We don't really have that much up here in Northern Michigan. Um, but I've seen uh, on online, it's nextdoor.com, which I don't like, but it's a thing that everybody around here signed up for. And so I get these email notifications uh, about people saying, hey, um, if there's anybody who uh, is concerned or you know, at high risk and they want things delivered or they need you know, their dogs walked or they need something done at their house, just let me know. I'm, you know, I'm able to come in and do things for people. And these are people that we don't even know. And so it, it's, it's helped me yep. remember that while human beings are the absolute worst, they're also the only thing that makes it all worthwhile, right? I mean, it, it just, when we can humanize each other, I, I think we see the best in humanity. And if nothing else, I think this is making us see each other as people who are vulnerable. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the horribleness of this, this pandemic is going to humanize uh, each, you know, everybody, politically, personally, uh, all of the issues that we struggle with, I, I think that the need, the needs of the, of the many are going to hopefully open the eyes of, of the many as well. You thought I was going Star Trek there and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean. That, that was perfection. That was perfection. I do hope yeah. that there's some, there are some positive things that come out of this. I think there's an opportunity for innovation. You know, there, there's a, an opportunity for a lot of positive. That that is a big. I, I wonder, and I don't know if any of us have anything to report yet. I mean, I, I said earlier that one of my fears is that the big companies take over even more than they already have. But I also think inevitably there's going to be lots of of ad hoc and then you know perfected and formalized forms of software approaches to things that um, that is going to uncork a flood of innovation when this thing's over or even as it's going on. Does anybody know of any of those that are in the works right now that are I can tell you happening? that there are restaurants that do online ordering and delivery that have never considered that in the past. Yeah, there's one in our family that's doing that. And, 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 and here's an interesting story about that. I mean, on the one hand, it's really sad that uh, this is my sister-in-law. She had to lay off some people. Um, but on the other hand, 
um, she's come up with a whole new menu, which is just basically, okay, here's the thing. We're making a meal. Here's it. Here's what it is. You know, <laughs> tonight it's going to be tacos with this and that. But they're actually doing the, the thing that's an instant hit in a way is is three course meals. Okay, here's here here is the complete prefix meal. Here's the wine that's matched with it. Here, if you if you want that, that's what we're selling tonight. And you can drive by and pick it up. We're, we're we'll put it out on the back here. We don't have to touch each other. You know, we've got a little you know backyard you know backside of the restaurant thing. Um, and that's working so far. That's, it, you know, that's, that's a kind of innovation on their part. And that'll probably stick, right? I'd, I'd do that. It might, it might stick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a, a small thing here, and this is not an innovation, but it was, you know, there's a, we live on a hillside. We're way up on a, we're 500 feet up overlooking the Pacific, but the hill goes up to a thousand feet behind us. And um, the kind of thing that we're in northern Michigan it would be a, a state park, <laughs> but instead it's just it's just some streets in the suburbs of California. But um, uh, up the street, I see this the little boy trying to play basketball without a basket, and and he just has a ball and he's throwing it up where you would imagine a basket is. And they're on they have a very steep driveway, and he keeps losing the the ball going down the hill. And so I went up the hill and I said, "Hey, look, I've got." I've got a flat driveway here. I actually built it as my own little basketball uh, court, you know, so I could practice. It's the only, the only sport I was ever at all good at. And, um, and it's long gone. I should have 4% now, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, and it was great. We had this great, you know, and that they know that they can come down here and shoot hoops if they want, you know, and um, I got to know this guy. I never met him before. You know, he's got, we exchange stories about how we're coping and, and the rest of it, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And, you know, neighbors are being made that weren't before because they're stuck at home, <laughs> which is interesting. That is interesting. And, and here, here's my hope that, that those kind of relationships can continue to happen and grow. And ironically, in a time where we're not to be around people, <laughs> the people that are around us might become uh, more a part of our lives. Whereas, you know, this kid might come and play basketball in your driveway instead of you trying to keep kids out of your driveway because if they get hurt, they're going to sue you. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I hate that. I, 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 I would never have done that, but you're right. I mean, that, that's, that's a perfect, perfectly good example of yeah. how that might work. Yeah. I would do that. So you would sue. You would sue Doc. I, I get that. <laughs> get off my yard. Get off my. Get out of my court. <laughs> well, my biggest concern about all of this is the bounce back. You know, at a certain point, uh, while <clears throat> normalcy, I, I, I guess it's it's. I guess it depends on how we define what normalcy is, right? You know, we're going. Yeah. We're going to come out of this. We're we're going to survive. Um, but what? what's what is the future going to look like you know in the case of restaurants right a lot of them are adapting to the current situation even though the restaurants themselves are physically shut down for dine-in patrons um at the end of the day some of them are adapting doing a takeout model while others are just shutting down officially but even after that once everything is the dust has cleared our are people going to continue going to eat out? Is there confidence in the way, you know, restaurants are, are, are kept and maintained and limit the spread of disease? Uh, is, is there going to be confidence in that? What, what is, what is that market going to look like? What is, what are other markets going to look like? Ones that maybe haven't been able to adapt so well, you know, the industries that you and I are in, all of us, I mean, we're in the tech industry. So saying working remote, uh, we're able to adapt, you know, which is great, you know, more than others. But then there are some industries, like what about that mom and pop, you know, owned hardware store? Obviously, the big box stores like your Home Depots or your Lowe's, you know, they're going to yeah. be. But then you have the little places that may not survive beyond this. So on the, the local scale, I anticipate a lot of, change and maybe not yeah. depending how long it goes too i think we might see yeah. a, we might see a post depression type mentality when it comes to uh income and buying goods and and going out to restaurants you know i mean we we know the the 
the older folks who, um, you know, penny pinch and, and, and have all this food in their cupboards because of the lacking that they had, depending how long this goes. I mean, it's not going to be the same, uh, but there's going to be a, you know, I, I can already see myself not going out to restaurants as much, not, not even because I'm, I'm concerned about the health issues, but just because like, wow, you know, I mean, when we were stuck at home, we were healthier and, you know, I know how to cook now. And, um, and Kyle picked on me a little bit. Maybe it wasn't me who was picking on, but you know, I make some pretty mean sourdough bread now. Uh, oh, but, I've seen. It's very impressive. I, I want to get back to it. I made sourdough bread a thousand years ago and um, I want to start doing it again. Well, hey, if you want a starter, I know a guy that can hook you up. I have oh, really? and I've named them each, Gus and Belinda. So yeah. does he ship sourdough? Is that is that does he ship starter? I, I'll ship a starter. Oh, I'll ship a starter for you. You would be not even close to the first person who has some of my starters. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to take you up on that. That'd be All great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work that out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in terms of small business, I mean, I even saw myself, there's a local brew, uh, brewing supply store that I get ingredients when I'm making beer. And when I was rushing back, I, you know, at the begin last week, the early part of this week, I was out um, working from the van out remote. My, my version of social distancing was, pack the family in a van and go out to a campsite away from everybody and work out of there, you know, as long as they have a good cell signal, it works. Um, but when our county was going to go on, I, I suspected our county was going to go on lockdown. I, I realized, well, I need to head back here. And I started thinking along the way, well, what do I need to get? Once, once they go on lockdown, all of these different stores are going to close. And I realized, oh, wait, I need to get, I want to, you know, have a batch of beer going um, because if this, stuff extends for a long time it would be nice to have that going and so I figured I planned well I'm going to get back on such such a day the next day I'm going to make a little trip over to the supply store and, and get my ingredients and sure enough they announced the lockdown that night uh, which meant that everything was shut down you know and so I found myself having to order online where mm -hmm. normally I would never do that I would go support my local guy and so then mm -hmm. you just bought all the toilet paper you could and called it good Actually, yeah, I, I bought oh, as yeah, yeah, Stella course. as I could to to hold me. <laughs> He's got his Stella. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, Sean, this is this is where your your bidet really comes in handy, man. I mean, you're, you, you have should no really idea. Be, like, you should get sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope your local brew shop guy is able to uh, pivot in some way. Well, well that, here, that doesn't know. Here's a business that may actually go away to some degree. And this is one where it, uh, that, that's affecting me very uh, personally, which is the conference business. Um, I, make, I make money speaking. And, um, and we have a conference also. There's the Internet Identity Workshop, IW. Our 30th one was coming up at the end of uh, April. And it's going to go virtual, right? We're going to go online for this thing. Um, and that's going to be a fun experiment. And I, I imagine we will come back. Um, uh, it's a, it's not a, um, a very co a corporatized thing. It's an unconference. There are no speakers. We're not paying anybody uh, to come in and talk. We, we have our sponsors only buy food. That's been a weird one because they can't buy food this way. We, we're just going to have them sponsor some rooms or something like that. But um, there's another conference I'm going to in Germany. I was going to be paid to go to that. That's almost certainly not going to happen. Um, and on 9-11, after 9-11, um, I lost a lot of money <laughs> you know, because a lot of conferences just shut down. When the airlines aren't working, conferences aren't working. And, um, and the airlines aren't working right now. They, uh, some of them may fail. Uh, and uh, that's going to that's gonna be an interesting thing. I think we may even see the, the obsolescence of the conference uh, in, as, as we knew it, you know, where you, where you had to have um, – you know, did this big gathering. I, mean, I, have a, I think it's a serious question because they said they were not insured uh, whether South by is going to come back. Um, oh. You know, that's a real, a real risk that uh, South by Southwest may be done. I, I suspect not, but I'm also wondering whether they'll get the same attendance they ever got before, you know, or a lot of, if the, a lot of the sponsors that had to eat gigantic costs this time around are going to want to come back again and show off their stuff in the old way. It's going to be an interesting thing. Yeah, I'm actually in the middle of a conference right now, which is kind of funny. Um, there's a Drupal event called MidCamp that happens in uh, Chicago, and they just switched it to an online event, and all, they're having all the same speakers are doing their sessions over Zoom, and I've been 
watching some and it's actually they've done a great job um but yeah i mean I, is this is this it i mean there we lose so much losing that hallway track i, I would hate to see a lot of events go away but you know it, this is yeah it's unprecedented also i talked about this just in a while well, a truck cam which i brought back the other day truck cam i haven't done that oh, in like a decade i, I, know. Truck cam. Yeah, I gotta so watch that I, yeah it's on youtube but um Talking about conferences, you know, they're all getting canceled. Um, and a lot of like Zoom, I, this is actually the first time I've used Zoom is this, this talk here, but um, a lot of the things that I'm attending now are all online, but I mean, we're, we're multitaskers, right? I mean, this is what we do for a living. So if I'm watching a conference or a speaker in a window, I'm also doing this over here and I have a terminal window up here and I'm debugging this over here and I'm yeah. sending an email here and I'm slacking over here. Um, part of the thing I talked about in the truck cam is, uh, you know, are we going to have some way to get immersed in it? And if it's, I mean, I, I hate to bring up virtual reality, but I love VR and it's just one of the things I love, but is that a way that we're going to be able to immerse into a thing? Uh, where we can actually pay attention because if it's going to be in a window like this zoom window, I, I just texted a friend of mine in Alaska while you guys were talking. And that's because one, I'm a horrible person, but two, because it was accessible. It was right there. Yeah, uh, and, you can. <laughs> yeah. And when you're in a conference, I mean, you can talk to the person next to you about what's for lunch, but it's different than doing different things on your screen. And I, I worry that we're going to lose a lot. The hallway track is a good point too. I mean, that's a huge part of conferences. That's a huge part of anything you attend in person is what happens at lunch and what happens when you're waiting for somebody to come in. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to fix that. Uh, if, if like doc, you brought up, I don't, I don't know that we're ever going to have conferences like they were right. All these cancellations and how the companies had to cope with it. We've, we're kind of inventing a solution for a problem we didn't know we had. And I don't know if the traditional conference is going to come back like it has. Like in yeah, the well, you know, here's the thing. Conferences are made, they're funded by sponsors. Okay. For the most part, not entirely. Some of them don't have sponsors, but, um, but sponsors are a huge part of it. And, um, and marketing in general, and it's generally in a marketing budget, um, is very discretionary. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's on the expense side of the, of the uh, balance sheet, right? They, they go looking for things they can cut. Things are, times are tough. What are we going to cut here? We're cutting travel. We're cutting sponsorships. We're cutting, you know, what are the, you know, our, 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 our underwriting of the public television station or radio Health station. Insurance. Sorry. That's yeah. We're, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens there. Yeah. I would like to just quickly plug DrupalCon. <laughs> I actually was a little, I was a volunteer actually this year on the, the sessions committee. It's been a great experience, but DrupalCon is one of the many conferences that will be affected and they haven't officially made a, a final announcement, but it looks like it's going to be postponed. But I would like to point out that all the, the sponsors are really getting behind it and, and keeping their commitments and that we're, this is a moment for the Drupal community to shine and, and there's definitely um, you know just a lot of support individuals are, are, are contributing they're joining the association people recognize the, the let's say threat to the community um, and are stepping up which is actually a really nice thing to see um, but yeah I mean I, I think I think some very important events will, will will continue they'll come back in some form but yes this does fundamentally change everything but before, before we go way too long, I wanted to make sure, um, I feel like we have neglected the van life topic. <laughs> I was so excited to, to, to talk a little bit more with Kyle about um, working remotely from his badass van. And I thought maybe we could save a little time for that. <laughs> All right, sure, yeah. I mean, so this is, this is sort of a side benefit of if you're working somewhere that's fully remote, then um, I, you know, your home, typically if you work remotely for a long time, you'll have a pretty nice home office setup at some point that works for you. But in many cases, you, you know, a lot of people that work from home will also, sometimes they'll go to a co-working space or they will go to a coffee shop or that sort of thing um, because they can work from anywhere. Well, what, what we do, because my wife also works from home, is when my son is out of school for spring break or summer break or whatever it is, um, sometimes we will decide to take, we kind of call it a workcation, where um, we'll hop in the van. I have a cellular booster that I reviewed on Linux Journal that works really well mm -hmm. um, that I turn on. And if I have solid internet, then I can work. And it's, it's like anything else where, you know, I will spend a couple of days on a weekend days 
getting to a place. Um, and then once we're there, we'll spend the week, you know, we'll work from the van and get our work done for the day. And then, you know, maybe take a, during lunch, if we're at a campsite, go on a hike or something, come back after lunch and work some more. And then around dinner time, go, you know, do other things, sightsee. Um, and yeah, I, I found it to be really effective because you, you get a chance to be somewhere else in a different surroundings. But as long as you have that internet connection, um, you can get a whole lot done. So I, I highly recommend it. I, it's, it's just a nice break from the schedule where we, we get to go and be in places where we otherwise may not be able to just because we can work from there. You know, of course, it requires you, you to have um, be, res be responsible the kind of person who can make sure that you get all of your work done. Um, so it may not work for everybody, but it certainly works for me. And, and some incredibly beautiful places, I would like to point out. I, you know, I, I follow every single <laughs> photo you post because they're amazing. Yeah. What are some of the places you've been, Kyle? Um, well, let's see. So most recently, I went over to the Owens Valley, which is on the other side of the Sierras. Um, yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's just a gorgeous place. And there's a lot of, especially on the west coast of the United States, there's a lot of um, Bureau of Land Management campsites that are free, where you can stay for free for up to two weeks. Um, you know, there's no, there's no restrooms, there's no, you have to be self-contained in your vehicle, um, but we are. And so you can just go to the site and you don't really have to pay anything and you sort of show up and there are these gorgeous locations. So we've done that. I've gone up the West Coast of the United States. Um, we, one time I worked out of Bryce Canyon, which is a really great place to work out of because the campsites are right next to the canyon. Um, mm -hmm. So you can, you can, you know, you work out of the van and then when you, for lunch, you could just do a hike down the canyon and see the entire site you know, and then hike back really quickly back to your, right, back to your van. Um, when lunch is over, that sort of thing. So that's been great. Um, I've, I've gone all the way over. I met up with Sean on an extended workcation like this uh, over to Michigan. Yeah. So I was driving all the way. We, we drove, I drove from California ultimately all the way up to the tip of the middle finger of Michigan. Um, and then all the way back over the course of, it was about a three week trip um, that a lot of it, a lot of it was, a, I think one, one week was like a vacation week, maybe, I, I don't remember now, but um, a lot of it was just a, like a working trip where, you know, there are long driving days would be on the weekends. We get those behind us and then get somewhere and stay put and work for a couple of days. Basically living the dream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we have so many plans for that. I have a, I have a cousin who is a park ranger in Carlsbad Caverns. Oh, wow. And I would love, to, we, one of these days, I want to go and we're going to do some, a similar kind of trip where we drive over there and, uh, you know, get some private cave tours and that sort of thing. Very cool. Yeah, fun. Well, on that note, that's a very positive note. Any, any parting words of wisdom for our listeners? Any, yes. Any? Me, me, me. Yes. Wash, Excellent. Wash your hands. Mm. <laughs> that is that that's really probably the most important word of wisdom right now See, well, wash, mic wash, drop wash moment <laughs> i think yeah that was a mic drop it's been great yeah, hey, thanks everybody let's let's do more of this this is a good one yeah i think we should especially as this you know continues as we as we head off into the unknown horizon let's talk let's talk uh more and, and frequently you know I, I have some parting words if you don't mind yes please it's, uh appreciate your teachers they're obviously mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in uncharted territories, trying to do their best to, um, you know, to make sure that, uh, that your children's uh, education continues as with little disruption as possible. Yeah, and rec recognize the heroes, you know, out there that, yeah. I mean, we have the obvious ones. We have the doctors and the nurses and every, yeah. every person involved and, you know, medical staffing, but you also have, you know, your delivery drivers and you have people stocking groceries and people who are Ooh. responsible for our supply chain, of our food. These, these people are, you're putting themselves at risk and, and, you know, these are heroes at this point. And it's, it's, you know, nice to see that. People are, I think, recognizing the importance of, of a lot of yeah. those jobs. Any, anybody who's exposed, but because they have to be. I mean, that's a tough, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a big one. Yeah. On that note. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for hanging in this long. Let's try and stay as positive as we can. We will. All right. Good talking, everybody. I know. I miss yeah. it all. <laughs>